Well, we're outside Sabina Park in downtown Kingston. Just behind me, a statue of the great George Headley, the greatest cricketer that's come from this island. The Black Bradman, he was known as. And there have been a long line of very distinguished cricketers who've come from here. George Headley, Lawrence Rowe, Courtney Walsh, and, of course, Michael Holding. Where do you reckon the end of your run would have been about here? I'll, prob I'll probably come and turn around about here and take a few steps, trot into where the actual marker was and then start running. Super quick, Michael holding into the attack. He didn't bowl any looseness. First ball, on the spot, very, very fast. The first time in my life there's a comma in my <laughs> bank. <laughs> I remember that he had a tempo. Hit him a very nasty blow. We used to get through a day's play and we have a look around the dressing room and see if they're all here. That's good, that's a good start. No one's down at A and E. The call that uh, would change your life really and would change cricket, would revolutionise cricket, came from Clive Lloyd in 77 mm -hmm. to invite you to go and play World Series cricket for Kerry Packer. Clive is on the phone and he starts to explain to me what's happening with, with, with this World Series cricket. And I had no idea what was going on. And he said to me, two people are going to come to Jamaica and have a word with you because they want to sign up for West Indian cricketers. So I said, OK, who are these people that are coming to see me? He said, Austin Robertson and Tony Gregg. And when he said Tony Gregg, I said, who? They grovel. And I intend, with the help of Clasey and a few others, to make them grovel. So every single one of them signed up. The hardest to sign was Michael Holding, who uh, had a very close relationship with Michael Manley, I think his name was, who was the, the Prime Minister or the President of Jamaica at the time. And he needed to get clearance from him because uh, he thought that politically there might be a bit of an issue playing with South Africans. And so we had to fly there and wait for Michael to make a decision. And apparently Mr. Packer called Michael Manley. And the agreement was that those South Africans who did not play county cricket would not be involved in World Series cricket. Uh, there were about two or three of them, and Paka paid them off and they went back home. To put the call in context, at the time you're earning about $200 per test. A test match. Just the series before. And for one series, Kerry Packer's offering you $25,000. Australian. And it's for three years. Guaranteed for three years. And at that time, the Australian dollar was bigger than the US. So that's a lot of money. Did you, any part of you, think, well, this is too good to be true? A uh, matter of fact, when Greggy and Austin Robertson left Jamaica, they said give them about nine, ten days or perhaps two weeks to, to, for them to get back to the Australia and they'll send one third of the salary as upfront payment. So I'm there relaxing and cooling out and after a week or so I go to the bank with my savings book that which has to be updated, no internet banking and all that. I give the cashier my book for it to be updated. She does her thing in the machine and pushes back to me and there is no money. So I said, I knew this was not real. <laughs> this, there, there's no way people are paying people this summer with the money to play cricket. So anyway, I go back home with the bank book and I still say nothing to anyone. A few days later, I go back with the bank book again and I give the cashier, I say, can you update my book for me, please? And she does her thing in the machine and pushes back out. And when I open the bank book, the first time in my life, there's a comma in my <laughs> bank book. <laughs> I say, yes, this is for real, because you are not going to pay this money unless it's for real. Super quick, Michael holding into the attack. Wait, 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 that's close, that's out, yes. I got him. And he's out, that's it, finish of the innings. Tough cricket? Very tough cricket. They had the world's best cricketers playing. Not all the best cricketers, because none of the Indians came, but 50 of the world's best cricketers were playing in that series. There's no doubt World Series cricket made a huge difference to the West Indies, because, I mean, Kerry walked in, and fairly early on during the first season, when, and they must have lost uh, badly, I don't know who to, and he told them, if you're going to keep playing like that, he said, I've got a safe full of air tickets there. He said, I'll send you all back home. And from then on, everybody sort of realised that it, this was serious. And, and we, we, st we started winning, and winning just like um, losing is, con is contagious. 
There was a lot of very good teams around there, but the West Indies were just so far ahead of us all. They were a damn good side. And that's out! First ball! And there's bowling. Throughout the history of the game, fast bowlers have won test matches wherever, and they had four. Roberts holding Garner Croft. Game over. As a count, he's out. David Nien down out, first ball, Melbourne double to come. And he's gone, first ball, Greg Chappell, Port Murray, ball holding. Mikey was part of that great West Indies bowling attack under Clive Lloyd. They were winning everything in the early 80s. On the Clive Lloyd, we were one unit, we were one West Indies team. He didn't care where you were from. He just wanted good cricketers and he molded that team. That's going to be his hundred. A joyous Richards. Another holding delivery off a short run. And it's out. And it's caught. It's all over. Allison is gone. So there it is, the whitewash. And West Indies very convincingly win the series by a margin of five test matches to nothing. The blackwash, yeah. <laughs> we got absolutely hammered, yeah. yeah. It wasn't very pleasant. We used to get through a day's play and we have a look around the dressing room and see if they were all here. That's good, that's a good start. No one's down at A&E having an arm reset or whatever, or a jaw. So um, it, was, it was. It was really intense cricket and very, very tough. That's dangerous. That's hit him a very nasty blow. Very nasty blow indeed. I wanted to just um, read out a quote. Um, ahead of West Indies tour of England in 1991. Mm -hmm. It was in a cricket magazine. Yep. Another invasion is upon us by a West Indies team that is the most fearsome, the most successful, the most unpopular in the world. Their game is based on vengeance and violence and is fringed by arrogance. The only mercy is that they're not bringing their umpires with them. Pretty strong words. By David Frith. I'm well aware of them. But I don't think David Frith is in the majority. I think a lot of people all over the world, English people who even when we were beating England on a regular basis, enjoyed our cricket. People would not have turned up in the thousands and the tens of thousands that turned up to our cricket matches if they didn't enjoy watching us play. So David Fritz stands not alone, but he's in a minor group of people who think that. Fundamentally, this is a good place to bowl quick. Definitely. The pitch Hostile helps. atmosphere. Yeah. A pitch that I remember was kind of, they used to spin roll it, so you, you could almost see your reflection in the pitch. It was rock hard, your spikes wouldn't go in. Good place to bowl fast. Here at Sabina Park, with the crowd being behind you, you know that the adrenaline starts to flow as well. So you're looking to bowl fast, you're looking to bowl a few short balls and that sort of thing. But if you're a fast bowler and your sole purpose is to try and hurt people, something is wrong. Do fast bowlers need to have an inherent amount of nastiness and aggression in them or not? You have got to have some amount of aggression in you because that is a part of fast bowling. People talk about fast bowling should not be intimidating. Fast bowling is intimidating if you have pace. You don't even have to necessarily bowl arm bouncers to intimidate a batsman because they know that pace that you have got. They actually weren't bound to happy, real bound to happy above your head. They bowled it here. They were very accurate and very fast. And this is the awkward area all the time because where you're going to have to try and get over the ball to keep it down. And they were very intelligent, very accurate, and very, very quick. Oh, that was a nasty one, and he's gone. Just a little flick of the gloves. And a great disappointment there with Gar going to hold him. Caught by Dujon behind. When do you reckon you were quickest? Do you look back at your career? <sighs> I would say I was at my quickest early 80s, like 80, 81, 82. But which coincides course. with that famous over that you bowled to boycott, which wasn't here, but it was at, Barbados. at, at Barbados. When England left for the Caribbean in mid-January, they knew what to expect on the field. Incredibly hostile atmosphere to back up some very hostile bowlers. Yes, it was in terms of they wanted their own side to win. and They came to see their own team, which was one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time. Every ticket had been sold, but the local Barbadians, who hadn't managed to get one, were determined not to miss the second day's play. 
It was a great atmosphere if you were West Indian and you weren't at the receiving end of that quartet of uh, quick bowlers. By now, there wasn't even much room on the roof of the main stand. Well, the pitch was pretty good. Uh, can't complain about the pitch. It had pace and it had bounce, so they didn't really need much movement. You give quick bowlers that, that's all they're asking for. West Indies were all up for 265, not an enormous total by their standards. But it looked big enough as Michael Holding bowled the best over I've ever seen. It was his first and the unfortunate batsman was Jeff Boycott. And what happened was he, he didn't bowl any looseness. His first ball, on the spot, very, very fast. I still wouldn't say that's the best over I've ever bowled, but the effect that it had, you know, I can understand how people can go over the top ab about that over. The next ball whistled past his off stump as he tried to play it. And the thing about Michael was, he ran up so smoothly, so easily, that even when I faced him before in the ball very fast, I always thought, there's a bit more here if he really wants, and that's a little bit uh, makes you apprehensive, doesn't it? He came steaming in. It wasn't long to go in the day's play. The stump just went flying out the ground. When we went back, it nearly pinned the uh, wicketkeeper. Boycott out for a gun. The most prized wicket had been taken. The over went mad. I don't think I got one in the middle of the bat. One on the gloves, and I missed one, and eventually got out. And that was the thing, that all six were just in perfect symphony. The perfect over had, for him at least, the perfect ending. Well, it looked pretty good when I seen the <laughs> film. They were all jumping up and down, all the West Indies players. I said to Mikey, I have never seen you before in test cricket, running and bowl and over that quickly. He said, I warmed up in the dressing room because we know we had to try and get Boycott out early. He was the leader of the tank of probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, test playing team of all time. Uh, people say, oh, well, you know, they can't be the best of all time, they have a spinner. Well, when was he going to bowl? So, yeah, I, I think, personally, uh, I don't think there's ever been a better test team. Your eldest sister's house, Rima, but she was she's quite a bit older than you. Yeah, I am last in the family, as a matter of fact. It's Rima first, then my other sister, Marjorie, then my brother, Junior, who unfortunately died last month, and I am the last one. So he was the toddler. Yeah. Sorrily was spoiled. He Sorry. <laughs> Thoroughly spoiled. Sorrily spoiled. But not badly behaved, even though he was spoiled. Uh -huh. Yeah. He's obviously a special cricketer. Was there a sense of shared family pride? Of course, we we're all very proud of him, very proud of him. He went to the Bahamas with my father to play a match when he was 10 years old. He was playing for Melbourne Cricket Club. Your mum and dad would have travelled around to watch oh, him. They went everywhere that he played, uh -huh. you know. I remember that he had a temple. <laughs> <laughs> and Has he, he always would, been stubborn? He would throw yeah. stones at people. <laughs> if they bothered him. Us, not people on the street. Uh -huh. But if we tormented him, which we sometimes did, because we're that much older than he, uh -huh. and he'd get up and throw stones at us, you know? <laughs> Heading two hold. Oh, it's gone through, and there's an LBW feel, and he's out. He's moved up, and it's hit him, but it looked a good shot from here. Michael Holden, out for four. The one series you did lose in this remarkable run in New Zealand in 1980, I think, had some interesting umpiring. I mean, there's a famous photo of you in Dunedin smashing the stumps not out the of stumps. the ground, albeit very gracefully. <laughs> yeah, but it's not something that you look back on and, and say, yes, you know, you're happy about it or you're proud about it doing something like that. Those things don't belong in the game. But it had gotten to the point where I was just totally frustrated. Off the short run. All played at this one. Loud appeal for the court behind. Well, this is uh, a display of emotion by Michael Holding. 
Yeah, this was a good one. Certainly got close to it. You know, you can't really tell whether he got a nick. The ball's angling in a little bit there. Maybe it'd be a little bit of deflection. Who knows? And what made matters worse was what was happening on the radio before with them saying they're going to beat the Great Westerns and things like that. Michael Holding has shown rather more frustration than one would anticipate or expect. But sometimes, although you think, oh, I shouldn't have done that, it can bring the right result. Sometimes you do bad things that in the long run end up to be good things. What has happened in recent times, I think, is as a result of incidents like that and other incidents that took place around the same time or within, say, a five-year period. The neutral umpires. Yeah, with the neutral umpires, no. Because you used to have a lot of visiting teams that would get so upset when an umpire made a mistake. Could be a genuine mistake, but they say, no, he's an um umpire, he's cheating. No, with the neutral umpires, you'll accept it as a mistake. Move on. This pitch is very uncertain. We are not too sure how long the bounce will last. His style of commentary is unique. On to the stumps and gone. He has got the voice. It's always good Mikey's tips are in the commentary box. There's a few guys that have spent some cash with Michael Holding and, and regretted it.